Hello everyone, and welcome to the Russian Empire History Podcast. The history of all the peoples of the Russian Empire. I'm your host, J.P. Bristow. This is Season 1, The Forest, the Steppe, and the Birth of the Russian Empire. Episode 16, The Mysterious Slav. This episode is coming out a little later than I expected. Due to a change in my schedule, the time I had previously set aside for writing and recording is no longer available to me. It might change as I work it out, but for the time being I'm going to be switching to a midweek release, probably Thursdays in New Zealand, which will be Wednesday for most of you. So, 16 episodes and 9 months into this podcast, we finally arrive at the origins of the Slavs, a place many of you might have expected me to begin. Why leave the Slavs until last among the large families of peoples making up the Russian Empire? After all, they were the most numerous among them. There were several reasons. Decentering the Russians to make room for other peoples, trying to give you a picture of the wider geography and conditions of the region, establishing a sense of what would become Russia as not an area on the far periphery of a Eurocentric worldview, but a key area in a connected Eurasia. But beyond all that, and this may surprise you, it is because we know less about them. As we have seen in previous episodes, linguistics can give us a reasonably sure idea of the original Proto-Indo-European and Finno-Ugric homelands. The origins of the Turkic peoples are more obscure, and there is ongoing debate as to the relationship between Turkic and Mongolic and other Asian languages, but there is a consensus that they emerged in the Altai region. And we do not need to rely on linguistic reconstruction alone. Archaeology and DNA research has corroborated linguistic theories and expanded our knowledge of their origins and movements. Although the Finno-Ugric peoples may not have left behind anything to compare to Greco-Scythian gold or massive Gorodishi, they have left enough to give us a decent picture of who they were. We have written records of Iranic peoples from China, Central Asia and the Mediterranean going back thousands of years and similar records tracing the appearance and expansion of the Turkic peoples. We have nothing of that for the Slavs. They have been described as simply appearing. There is no consensus on an Urheimat for the linguistic family, no clear archaeological record, although there are some things we shall look at that have been put forward as the archaeological remains of the Slavs. Classical authors are of little help, although some scholars have tried to claim certain tribes mentioned as Slavs. Essentially, there is no reliable evidence of Slavs before the 6th century. We have already noted how our modern notions of ethnicity, which most people might assume involve some kind of shared ancestry or homeland, might differ from historical viewpoints based on language, religion or a particular lifestyle. And this is true again when looking at Slavic ethnogenesis. When did people become Slavs? Did they give themselves the name, or did other people around them? For instance, you might be surprised to learn that there are no known sources in which Poles refer to themselves as Slavs from before the 14th century. Of course, there were definitely people calling themselves Slavs in what would become Russia well before that. So let's look at what we know and what we don't know and some of the assumptions and claims made about their origins. In previous episodes, we have mentioned the origin myths of the Scythians and Turkic peoples, which can provide historians with valuable clues as to where they come from, as well as being a key part of a sense of ethnic identity. Sadly, there is no Slav origin myth. The closest thing we have is in the tale of bygone years, often referred to 
as the Russian Primary Chronicle, a work compiled in Kiev in the early 12th century. According to the tale, Slavs, like Armenians, Britons, Dalmatians, and other inhabitants of Europe, are the descendants of Japheth, one of Noah's three sons. There were twelve tribes of Slavs, including the Polyanians, who settled on the Dnieper and built Kiev. Now I think most of you will have twigged that this is not actually a Slav origin myth. Rather, the tale, like most medieval chronicles, was written by monks, traditionally one fellow by the name of Nestor the Chronicler, who have clearly made up a story that ties the Slavs into the Bible. It was the done thing at the time to start your history with the flood, and everyone in the world is descended from the three sons of Noah who survived it. Twelve tribes of Israel, twelve tribes of Slavs, you get the picture. Like many chronicles, the tale is at least in part a political work, intended to justify the status quo and rulership, so it talks up the church and is dismissive of Slavs' pagan past. The tale of bygone years therefore provides us with no help on the origin of the Slavs. What then of linguistic reconstruction, so helpful with the Iranic and Finno-Ugrian peoples, although somewhat less so with the Turkic peoples? All Slavic languages descend from common Slavic, which split to give rise to modern Slavic languages approximately after the 600s. Slavic languages are part of the Indo-European language family, and before the Slavic branch was formed, there was a Proto-Baltic Slavic, which was also the ancestor of Lithuanian, Latvian, and Prussian. Some scholars argue for a Proto-German Baltic Slavic as the common ancestor of Slavic, Baltic, and Germanic languages. Linguists have attempted to locate a Slavic Urheimat, using the same approaches as we have seen with other languages which we could summarise as using the names of flora and fauna, using traces of contact with other languages, and using place names. So, in the early 20th century, Polish botanist Józef Rostofinski noted that the Slavic words for beech, fir, white maple, larch and yew, which he designated as Western European trees, derived from German, while the word for hornbeam has a Slavic root in all modern Slavic languages. Using the modern distribution of those tree species, he decided that the original homeland of the Slavs must have been in the Pripyat marshes, lying today near the ukrainian belarusian border. Other scholars disagree. A French linguist, Antoine Mier, tried to reconstruct a common Slavic by comparing modern Slavic languages, but decided it was not possible to pin it down to any particular time and place. A German linguist, Max Fasmer, worked in the first half of the 20th century from the assumption that common Slavic must have been spoken within a limited territory in order to minimise dialectal differences. Working by the exclusion method, and eliminating areas where he believed the place names had Iranian, finno ugrian or Baltic roots, Phasma placed the Urheimat south of Pripyat, on the west bank of the Dnieper. This approach has proven popular. This approach has proven popular, but has provided a wide range of results. In the late 20th century, Russian linguist Oleg Trubachev ruled out the Dnieper region as the Slavic Urheimat, on the basis that the rivers in the region have names that are not derived from Slavic, but rather from Thracian, an extinct language of southeastern Europe that was possibly in the Baltic family. Trubachov also eliminated the Dniester Basin in western Ukraine, on the basis that the rivers there have Illyrian names. His analysis led him to the conclusion based on place names in Hungary and Slovakia, that the Slavic homeland lay in the Carpathian Basin. Another German linguist, Jürgen Udolf, carried out an analysis of place names based on a number of factors. 
the concentration of place names that are found in all Slavic languages, river names found only in South Slavic, place names that preserve ancient Ablaut forms. If you recall episode 2, the Ablaut form is sound changes within a word, such as in the English verb sing, sang, sung, which were part of the original structure of Proto-Indo-European and are therefore present in words with particularly ancient roots, as well as rivers that have names from pre-Slavic languages. So, river names derived from this common Slavic name for spring can be found in Ukraine, Romania and Moldova. But in Bulgaria and Macedonia, they preserved the Ablaut form. On the other hand, rivers in Poland have pre-Slavic word endings. Based on his analysis, he placed the Slavic Urheimat between Zakopane in southern Poland and Bukovina, a region now divided between Ukraine and Romania. Using place names like this might sound like a solid basis for reaching conclusions on the first Slavic homeland, but several criticisms have prevented general acceptance. First, if you're listening attentively, you will have noticed that these linguists have classed place names differently. Thracian and Illyrian are extinct and poorly attested languages. Not all attempts to derive word origins from Slavic, Illyrian or Thracian roots have been widely accepted, and some scholars have argued that frequently found place names may merely reflect a common Indo-European root. Sociolinguistics have also argued that river names tend to reflect the language of the lowest social class, such as a subject people in an otherwise multilingual region, so they may not be a reliable indicator of the ethnic makeup of an area. So if place names and ecological elements point to different places of origin, what of language contact? Here, what linguistics are looking at is the way different languages influence each other. For example, Slavic has a strong Germanic lexical influence, which means that it has taken words from Germanic, but not the grammar or structure. Sociolinguists would say that this indicates that Slavic speakers were imitating more prestigious German speakers. You might think of French words borrowed into English following the Norman conquest. Slavic also shows the influence of Altaic contact, particularly from the Huns, as well as traces of early contact with Iranic, Proto-Romanian and Thracian. Romanian linguist Sorin Palica has placed the Slavic homeland in northern Romania, emerging from a combination of a southern branch of Balto-Slavic, a western Iranic branch and Thracian. Other scholars have argued for a homeland inside modern Poland on the basis of contact with Celtic. However, this seems like a real stretch, as Florin Kurta notes, to date only four borrowings from Celtic have been found. As well as differences over the location of the Slavic homeland, we also have a huge range of dates. Phasma placed common Slavic between 400 BCE and 400 AD. Other scholars push it as far back as 1500 BCE. We also do not have an agreement as to what kind of language common Slavic was. The American linguist Horace Lunt asserted that common Slavic had spread as a lingua franca, that is, a language that is used by people who speak different native languages when they trade or exchange other information. We have already mentioned Sogdian as the language of trade in the steppe, for instance. And although we don't really use the term lingua franca anymore, many international companies and organisations will use English for this purpose. Other scholars have argued that common Slavic was a Koine language. Koine is a Greek for common, and Koine Greek was the language of the Byzantine Empire. 
Koine Greek replaced regional dialects with a common language. So in contrast to a lingua franca, where the speakers have different native languages that may be completely mutually unintelligible and not include the lingua franca itself, the Koine is one of a set of dialects with differing degrees of mutual intelligibility that becomes dominant. This makes them more or less opposites of each other. So as much as it would be nice to have a clear Slavic Urheimat, so far scholars have not reached any consensus on where it might be. The three main linguistic theories are the region bounded by the Carpathians, the Pripyat Marshes and the Middle Dnieper, the region on the Middle Danube, and the region between the Oda and the Vistula, all of which have been criticised extensively. Does the archaeological evidence for the early Slavs help us lean one way or another? Czech archaeologists played a key role in the early archaeology of the Slavs. Lubor Nidali supported the idea of a Slavic homeland in Ukraine, where he believed the contact between early Slavs existing in a primitive state in the forest and Romans had led to the adoption of pottery. His follower, Chenek Hoika, excavated a site at Chernyarhiv, 50 kilometers outside Kiev, using his discoveries to designate the Chernyakhov culture, taking the Russian name of the village. Other Czech archaeologists continued to look for the missing links between Roman pottery and later Slavic pottery. Emanuel Szymek put forward the idea that some pottery found in a Prague suburb represented the Velislavin type. Ivan Borkovsky proposed the Prague type, a handmade, mica-tempered, undecorated pottery that Slavs had adopted based on Celtic traditions as the earliest form of Slavic pottery. In this case, handmade means that the items were formed by hand, not on a potter's wheel which is taken as one of the defining characteristics of early Slavic pottery. By this time, that great historian Stalin was getting involved. A great Slavic homeland stretching from Poland to the Black Sea was seen as an important propaganda tool in the Soviet fight back against Nazi Germany's invasion. Archaeological finds from across the region were claimed as Slavic, even taking in the Kukatieni Tripilia or Trupolia culture, found in southern Ukraine and Romania, which was overwhelmed by the Indo-European migration into Europe and climate change millennia ago. The Soviet Union carried out extensive archaeological investigations after the war. Sergei Gamchenko found pottery at a village called Korchak, near Zhitomir, that he dubbed the Zhitomir style and which was older than the Prague-style finds, moving the earliest Slavic finds from Czechoslovakia to Ukraine. But Irina Rusova reclassified them as the prague Korchak type, claiming they had consistent features. Prominent Russian archaeologist Valentin Sedov determined two types of pottery, which he related to the Antes and Sklavene, two tribes referred to in Roman sources that many wished to claim as Slavs. Sidov argued that the Prisjavursk culture found in the Vistula region between the 1st century BCE and the 1st century CE actually corresponded to the Venedi, a tribe mentioned by Tacitus that he decided were Slavs. In his view, the Venedi then migrated into the Upper Dniester over the next couple of centuries to form the majority in central and western Ukraine. They absorbed all the other cultures, Chernyakov, Zarubinsi, and so on, before this Prizhevorsk culture itself split in the 4th century to form the Antes and Sklavenis. It was these new ethnic groups that were responsible 
for the Penkovka and Prague Korchak cultures. This course of development was intended to align the archaeological and linguistic research with each other. Another school of thought saw the sunken floor building, rather than handmade pottery, as the defining remnant of early Slav settlements. This view restored the Chernyakov culture as the origin of the Slavs, seeing them as part of a Gothic confederacy that had become an independent polity following a period of Hunnic rule. After World War II, as Moscow-dominated communist governments were established across Eastern Europe, scholars were forced to follow the line enforced by the Soviet Union. Czechoslovakia had to give up the idea of the Prague culture as the origin of early Slavs in favour of migrants from Ukraine. Now the position was that early Slavs could be identified by Zhitomir Korchak type pottery, of which the Prague type was merely a local variant. The Poles stuck to their linguistically derived ideas of a Polish Slav homeland for longer, but eventually they succumbed to the archaeological evidence. Kazimierz Gosodlowski, who saw a combination of pottery, sunken floored buildings and cremation, along with an absence of craft specialization and metalworking centers, as the key indicators of early Slavs, asserted that starting from Bukovina, the Slavic culture had formed a large area bounded by the Carpathians, the Pripyat and the Dnieper, and then expanded into the parts of Eastern and Central Europe, vacated by migrating Germanic people. This view brought the origin of the Slavs back from the Bronze Age to the 5th century CE, with the first Slavs arriving in Poland from Ukraine in the 6th century. One of the main problems with earlier origin dates is the big chronological gaps between cultures. Some scholars assert that the Zarubinsi culture of 300 BCE to the 1st century CE is the Proto-Slavs, but they are also believed to have been completely destroyed by the Sarmatians, so what would have happened to their language? There is a gap of two centuries between the Zarubinsi and the Kiev culture that some treat as the Venedi, and the archaeology shows that they ended with the abandonment of their settlements. Where did the Slavs disappear to during these gaps, and why did they come back? Actually, since we have no record of any language spoken by any of these peoples, any attempt to treat them as Slavs is mere guesswork. And as just noted, there is a clear evidence of discontinuity in the settlement of the region. Many of the finds that are presented as early Slavic cannot be reliably dated, and the Prague-type pottery presented as evidence of Slavic migration west and north is completely missing south and east of central Ukraine, that is, in the areas where we have the earliest written records of the Slavs. The key indicators of Slavic culture are also problematic. Handmade pottery, sunken houses and cremations were widespread. They are typical of Anglo-Saxon England, for instance. They are not consistent across the supposed Slav region. One area has sunken houses with an oven in the corner. Another has sunken houses with open fireplaces in the centre. Are they different peoples? So archaeology is little more help to us than linguistics. The material evidence for the Slavs leaves their origins still a mystery. Although many scholars have made the assumption that if Slavs appeared in Ukraine in the 500s, people there thousands of years earlier must have been their ancestors, that remains nothing more than an assumption, and it is not necessarily the case that there is any connection between them. I've already mentioned a couple of names, Antis, Sklavini, Venedi, that have been claimed as Slavic tribes. So let's now take a look at what the written sources can tell us about Slavic origins. Our first mention of a people called Slavs 
comes in the catalogue of fortresses and regions to the north of the Danube, written by an unknown author known as the Bavarian Geographer. Written around 900, the second part refers to the Zeruani, who come from a kingdom from which all the Slavic people have come and originated. Other than this mention, the Zeriani are unknown, although some suggest that they lived in Chirin, present-day Lviv region. It is also noteworthy that it says the Slavs all come from a certain place, and therefore implies that they spread by migration. Given the lack of information, though, it has not been used to propose the Slavic Urheimat. Instead, we have to go back to a couple of Greeks, Procopius and Theophylact Simocata, and three Latin sources, Jordanus, Fredegar, and Martin of Braga, and look at how they have been interpreted. Two of the Latin sources refer to the Venedi, who also get a brief mention in Pliny the Elder, Tacitus, and Ptolemy. Jordanus writes that the Venedi live in Scythia, quote, near the left ridge, which inclines northwards, and beginning at the source of the Vistula, the populous race of the Venedi dwell, occupying a great expanse of land. Their names are now dispersed among various clans and places, but they are chiefly called the Sclavenes and Andes. End quote. The king of the Ostrogoths, Erminaric, invades the land of the Venedi, and Jordanus has no respect for their resistance, calling them a multitude of cowards. Following the death of Erminaric, the Ostrogoths are subjugated by the Huns, but not liking the role of underling, the new king, Vinitharius, takes them into the lands of the Antes. Although initially losing a battle, he eventually overcomes the Antes and crucifies their king, Boz, his sons and seventy nobles, leaving their bodies on display to create a suitably submissive attitude in his new vassals. However, none of Jordanus' contemporaries refer to the Venedi as the source of the Sclavines and Antes, and his Antes are on the Black Sea coast. Jordanus uses two different spellings of the words Vistula and Antes, suggesting that he is trying to reconcile two varying sources, while adding his own spin to fit in with his purposes in writing the history of the Goths. One of those purposes was to argue that the Goths could not leave Italy and go back whence they came, as the lands were inhospitable and had been occupied by other barbarians. Procopius' purpose was to illustrate what the role of the barbarians should be for Byzantium. So his Slavs are different. Instead of Venedi, he has Spore. For Procopius, the Sclavenes and Antes are nomads. For Jordanes, they are swamp and forest dwellers. While Jordanes has them on the Vistula, Procopius sees them at the Danube, the frontier of the empire. In Jordanes, the Antes king Boz gets crucified. In Procopius, the Sclavenes and Antes are democrats, opposed to the rule of any one man. While Jordanes has at least heard of the Vistula, even if he can't decide how to spell it, for Procopius, Everything north of the border is terra incognita, and his tales of Herules wandering through the land of the Sclavenes make no geographical sense at all. Procopius describes other military actions involving the Sclavenes, but again they are on the border of the empire, along the Danube, not up in the Pripyat marshes or Slovakia. In Theophylact Samakata's history, written in Constantinople around 630, three Sclavenes are captured by the emperor's bodyguard and questioned as to their origin. They declare themselves to be Sclavenes from the shore of the Western Ocean. This has been taken to mean that Slavs were already established on the Baltic coast by the late 6th century, but opposing scholars argue that the entire passage is merely literary invention. The encounter is part of a series of unexpected events that delay the emperor on his campaign. The three Sclavenes are carrying lyres instead of weapons, 
which is a bit of a literary trope. Telling the emperor that they come from the Western Ocean implies that they are aware of other oceans in Greek and Roman geography. And it may just be a rhetorical flourish, meaning a long way away, like the ends of the earth. Martin of Braga was the Bishop of Braga, who has been claimed as the author of a poem called In Basilica, which includes the lines, quote, You reconcile various brutish peoples under Christ's holy alliance, the Alaman, the Saxon, the Thuringian, the Pannonian, the Rugian, the Slav, the Nara, the Sarmatian, the Datus, the Ostrogoth, the Frank, the Burgundian, the Dacian, the Alan. They all rejoice that they know God. End quote. Slovenian archaeologist Jaroslav Šašel asserted that Martin was born in Pannonia, where he had encountered the various barbarian tribes he refers to in the poem. He left after 536, when Pannonia was conquered by the Gepids, meaning that the Slavs were already established in the region by that time. An alternative viewpoint is that Martin wrote the poem after he moved to Constantinople, based on local sources describing the various peoples on the periphery of the empire. As the Avars are missing, it must have been written before 568. Others disagree entirely, finding the text too different to other texts by Martin, including the epitaph he wrote to himself, to be written by the same man. The earliest other use of Slavs in a Latin text comes from a letter of Pope Gregory the Great, written in 600, and there are similar catalogues of people in several other 9th century texts. From this viewpoint, in Basilica is attributed to an unknown author in 9th century Carolingian Francia. Lastly, we come to Fredegar. Fredegar is not his actual name. The author was an unknown official in Austrasia. His description of the Wends from around 660 appears to be the first actual reference to the Slavs. Quote, Each year the Huns wintered with the Slavs, sleeping with their wives and daughters, imposing tribute and many other burdens on them. Eventually, the sons born to the Huns by the Slavs' wives and daughters could no longer bear this shameful oppression they refused to obey their lords and rose in rebellion. End quote. These rebel sons of Huns and Slav women took the name of Wends and appointed Samo, a Frank, as their king. Where did they come from and where were they located? There is no reference to any migration in the text. Tradition has it that they lived in Bohemia. But as they originated where the Huns, which is referring to Avars at this time, spent their winters, it had to be territory under their control. That means further south than the modern Czech Republic. So, where do these literary sources leave us with regard to the Slavic homeland? As Florin Kurta writes, quote, One simply cannot take Fredegar's Wendish account at face value, nor can one assume that Jordanus was familiar with the geography of East Central Europe. Procopius of Caesarea and Theophylact Samarcata were no objective reporters in the field and they certainly did not lack either literary skills or rhetorical sophistication. There is actually no information in Jordanus, Procopius or Theophylact Samarcata that could be of any use for the reconstruction of early Slavic history in Central or Eastern Europe. End quote. So, Having considered the linguistic, archaeological, and written evidence, all we can really reliably say about the Slavs is that there is no clear evidence of them anywhere before the 6th century. The lands where the 6th century Slavic settlements are found largely appear to have been depopulated before they settled. So we cannot be sure that they emerged from existing populations, but neither is there much sign of any mass long-distance migration. All the claims made for a Slavic homeland, from Poland to the Balkans, have substantial criticisms and rest on unsupported assumptions to one degree or another. 
but in recent years the prepit seems to have picked up the most followers, with some scholars pointing to a migration driven by agricultural practices. This area of the forest belt lies in the Black Earth region, whose reputation for fertility rests more on a comparison to the steppe than actual absolute productivity. It would eventually become the breadbasket of the world, thanks to its size, but the rate of yield is only half what a farmer might get in England or Holland. For the early Slavs, when cleared, this land would provide several years of high yields, which would then decline as nutrients were depleted. So a group, often an extended family group, would stay in one area for a few years and then move on to new, fresh land. Remains from the earliest sites show prosso millet as the main crop. As you might recall from the special episode with Robert Spengler, this was a low input crop. It could be planted without a plow, just scatter the seeds and leave it to mature in two to three months. But as I said, beyond this kind of movement over shortish distances, there is little sign of any great migration. The early settlements across the region date to around the same time. There is no evidence that the Pripyat area was depopulated as people moved away. The idea of common Slavic also does not match well to significant migrations. As populations move away from each other, their languages diverge. The early history of the Slavs, developed in the research of the past 200 years, has been driven by the tumultuous history of Eastern Europe over that period. Poles, Czechs, Ukrainians and Russians have all laid claim to being the homeland of the first Slavs as part of their national identity-building stories. Rather than starting from the evidence and working out what it shows, they have started from the assumption that there have always been Slavs and therefore their finds are necessarily early Slavic. The timeline of Slavic development is moved further and further back in service of the idea of Slavs as a distinct ancient people who have always been present on the lands where they reside, a process that has become known in Russia as Udrevnenya, making ancient. The evidence for depopulation of much of Eastern Europe before the Slavs is ignored, and the much cited Sklavenes of Byzantine sources being in the south, raiding across the Byzantine border, is glossed over. As Florin Kurta writes, quote, The recent archaeological literature on the early Slavs is therefore theoretically confused, methodologically debilitated, and driven by nationalist policies. In short, pseudoscience fake. In the end, we have to admit that we do not know, and will probably never know, where exactly the Slavs came from. As historian Serhii Plorki writes in his History of Ukraine, The Gates of Europe, where he dispatches with Slavic history from 7000 BCE to the 800s in 10 short pages out of the book's 460 total, quote, We know precious little about the Slavs who settled Ukrainian territory prior to the 10th and 11th centuries. Ignored by the chroniclers and remaining largely unknown to us is the process of their mostly peaceful colonization of Eastern Europe, which took them from their homeland part of which was in the northwestern regions of present-day Ukraine, deep into the Balkans in the south, beyond the Vistula and towards the Oder in the west, up to the Baltic Sea in the north, and to the Volga and Oka rivers in the east. End quote. But it does not really matter. The one irrefutable piece of evidence we have for Slavic migration is the presence of Slavs all over eastern and central Europe. Beyond that, some things in history will always remain a mystery. What we do know is that by this point in our story, around 600, the Slavs, who would go on to be the Rus, have appeared on the Great Plain. The Finnoagrians are in the forest, ready to create their kingdoms in the Urals. The Bulgars have begun their migration to the Volga, 
and the Khazars are ready to rise to dominance on the Western steppe. All the pieces for the next few centuries of our story are in place. Join me next episode as we return to the steppe and the establishment of the Khazar Khaganate. Each episode is an accompanying blog post where you can find maps, images of things we discuss, and sources. You can find the post through the link in the show notes or on the website at www.therussianempirehistorypodcast.com. You can get in touch with me via the website, Twitter, or Facebook or email to hello at the Russian Empire History Podcast.com. Thank you for listening. Until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.